today's brew talk. Is homebrew dangerous? Is homemade beer bad for you? Can you go blind from drinking homemade mead? Is wine that you make at home somehow more dangerous than stuff you buy in the store? These things and more. As always, we like to start off with some comments from our viewers. Zach Nolet, hey guys, I'm new to this making alcohol thing and I have a little concern about the fermenting step. Will my solution make wood alcohol, in parentheses, methanol? And if it does, will it have long-term effect on my health and the people I share my brews with? You know, that's a really good question and we get this question a lot. You're gonna hear various iterations of that question. I answered this question with this. All alcoholic beverages have methyls, even commercial brews, no more or less in homebrew. His response back was a little bit surprising too. By the way, I'm not picking on this guy at all. Zach asked a valid question and he has concerns. That's why we're addressing this. He said, thank you so much for your answer. I don't want to make people blind with my brew. Okay, we're gonna talk about that in a little while, but you cannot go blind from homebrew. Okay, let me just get that straight. You would pass out long before you got to that point. Okay, let me explain later. Ranjit Singh, is home beer as dangerous to eyes or life in any way as we listen sometimes about blindness and casualty? Okay, he's confusing distillation with homebrew. Also, beer doesn't even produce methyl alcohol, therefore not possible at all. Isaac Martinez, this is on ginger beer. Okay, this is on the ginger beer video. Is it safe to do this? I've heard things, not sure if they're true, about people going blind and whatnot. Is there a video on safety to prevent any mishaps from happening? No, we actually didn't do a video on the safety because it's probably not likely to happen. You see where we're going with this, right? Contrition, hey, just a question. Is there a way to avoid forming fusels and are they really bad for you or just cause hangovers? Now they're talking about fusels. We're talking about methyls, which they're not really the same thing, but they're sort of in the same category. There are some byproducts that are created whenever you ferment. It's kind of questionable as to whether they actually cause hangovers or not. But some people say that they do. But, you know, is there any way to avoid it? No. <laughs> they're formed when you ferment anything. Johan Beerbaum. Now this is some on a different topic, sort of. Thanks for the public info message on Applejack. You probably saved some people from dangerous consequences. I love your idea about shooting for flavor rather than alcohol content. Life should be worth living, not just an alcoholic haze. It might have something to do with maturity. I would like to say that if she knows me at all, it has absolutely nothing to do with maturity. <laughs> but she's talking about freeze distillation and freeze concentration, which in our area, it is very questionable as to whether it's illegal or not. The U.S. government defines distillation as any way that you remove water or alcohol from a liquid in order to increase the alcohol content of that liquid. Notice there was no use of the word still in there. They define the method rather than the equipment. Therefore, it is illegal where I live, and that's the rule that I'm going to go with. So we don't do it. However, I do know what happens when you do it. All that you're doing is taking the water out of the brew and leaving the alcohols, methyls, fusils, all the other stuff. So you're taking out something that's actually completely good for you and healthy for you and leaving everything else because you have to remember one thing. Alcohol is a poison. <laughs> In small amounts, it's a pleasurable poison. In larger amounts, it's a bad poison. Methyl is the same thing. There's just very, 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 very small amounts of methyl and fusils in our brews. But when you concentrate those, that's when bad things can happen. More on that in a little bit. Pierre Macram, I'm really curious about how much of methanol and fusils are in homebrewed beverages and could it be dangerous to drink a lot of homebrew because of this? It really scares me. Okay, I understand, he's scared. As far as his question, can it be dangerous to drink a lot of homebrew because of this? Yes and no. And I'll explain why in a little bit. I keep saying that, but there's a long answer to this. And I just want to show you how many people have been asking these questions. The short answer, if I'm allowed. Go for it. Is that drinking a lot of homebrew versus drinking a lot of commercial alcohol is relatively the same in the danger quotient. Yes, absolutely. 100% what she said. Gary Haugland. My local brew shop told me that mead can be dangerous to make, warning about bottle bombs and saying it takes three years from start to finish. I feel like their advice is a little overkill from all the content I've absorbed in these last few months. Okay, Gary, they're wrong. Plain and simple, wrong, wrong, wrongity, wrong, wrong, wrong. It doesn't take three years from start to finish. It can if you really want it to. 
it is no da more dangerous to make mead than it is to make beer, wine, or cider. And coming from a homebrew shop, I feel that that is completely wrong advice and that guy should be fired. My guess, my, my, <laughs> bleh, my best guess is that they actually don't know very much about mead. Which is very common. And so therefore just push it to the side as they don't, it's dangerous, yep. don't do that. We went to a local homebrew shop and started asking questions about mead and they acted like they knew what they were doing, but they didn't actually answer any questions. They, they had no idea. So people have a lot of misconceptions about mead in general. But meat is no more dangerous to make than anything else. As a matter of fact, beer, because of carbonation, can be much more dangerous for the bottle bomb aspect than mead would be. So I don't even know where he's going with that. But um, that's another thing. And you're right. It's completely overkill. And he's just wrong. <laughs> Namsa Langa. I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying some of these names right. I'm really sorry. Can I start a business by making a banana wine? Is it safe for consumption? I'll start with the first question. That is beyond the scope of our channel opening a business to produce alcohol depends on your region, where you live, where we are, it's prohibitive. It's not that simple. There's a lot of licenses, very expensive to get started. Just not something the average person is going to do because you need to have all the licenses and permits. You need to be inspected and you need to be doing it off site from where you live. Therefore you need a building and everything that comes along with that. So we're not going to do it. <laughs> so probably not likely for it to be practical for most people in the world to do. Is it safe for consumption? Well, of course it is. It's a wine. I mean, you know, whatever. Sanjeev Kumar. I have one worry and I hope you guys can clear it for me. Can home brewing ever go wrong so much that other poisonous chemicals such as methanol, isopropyl alcohol, ethylene alcohol may be from that may be harmful. By home brewing, I meant the procedures that you follow and the ingredients that you use, not including distillation. Okay, so he knows what he's asking. Um, isopropyl alcohol, I'm not so sure that that actually is produced by fermentation. I could be wrong. Somebody's going to correct me. One of you guys knows this. Um, I actually just print the questions out. I don't research them before I answer. That way you have, are just as surprised as I am at what gets said. But anyway, the methanol, things like that, those are all made during fer fermentation process and they're made in very minute amounts. So it's no more dangerous than buying beer or buying wine or mead or cider. A quick note on that. If you add to your homebrew an outside source such as rubbing that. alcohol. Yeah, don't do that. That is bad. Yeah. Rubbing alcohol is not intended to bite, be digested. Mm -hmm. So therefore do not add it to your brew or you will be poisoning yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tati Tamati. Tati Tamati? I don't know. Tati Tamati. We're going with that. Hi from South Africa. So I discovered your channel recently while on lockdown. In South Africa, we are not allowed to buy alcohol on lockdown, so it's been a long eight weeks. Obviously, this is from uh, a month ago. We feel you. Uh, in the meantime, like many of my fellow countrymen, I have resorted to home brewing mostly pineapple and ginger beer. They are pretty easy, and I have enjoyed the actual brewing part of it. I have a question might be dumb, but I can't find a definitive answer. Can you get methanol poisoning from home brewing? I've read a lot of articles on the subject on brewers forums and Facebook groups. They say it is basically impossible. The amount of methanol in home brewing is negligible. When I read articles in our newspapers with advice from scientists and expert brewers saying how dangerous home brewing is, and no, I don't mean distilling or anything they're talking about, how making fermented juice beer can give you methanol poisoning. If you read this far, thanks. What's your opinion? Great vid, by the way. I don't know what video this was on, but... Um, there's a lot of questions in here that we are going to talk about some of this stuff right now. I just want to go through this. Psst. Want to see behind the scenes and more information from City Setting? Join the VIP. Link in the description. In 2015, this was the headline from CNN. Poisonous homebrew kills 71 in Mozambique. Okay. What actually happened is they were drinking a, something known as Fombe, I believe is how you say it. It's a popular local, local drink. It's made from sorghum, bran corn, and sugar. And the belief is that, oh, here's their actual investigation. Samples of the beer, blood, and suspicious objects found within the drum. This was kept in a like a, an oil drum that apparently was not cleaned very well, from my understanding were sent for analysis to the National Laboratory. The investigation into the cause of the poisoning eventually turned up the presence of the bacterium 
Burkholderia gladioli and two toxins produced by it, bonkrekic acid and toxoflavin, in both the beer and the corn flour that was used to help brew it, concluded that those were responsible for the deaths and the illnesses. The investigative team determined that flood-damaged corn flour that had begun to, to rot had been offered to the brewer in the mistaken belief that while unfit for use as food, it was still suitable for use in brewing. Okay, that brings up something that we talk about all the time. If you wouldn't eat it, don't brew with it. If you wouldn't drink it, don't brew with it. Back in the day, it was a way to preserve food that was kind of on its way out. Today, don't do that. The dangers are too high. So what did we learn from that one? That the actual homebrew wasn't the problem. It was the infection of the ingredients that was the problem and caused a bacteria that happened to be dangerous to grow. It's an extraordinarily rare thing. However, one series of events leading up to it could happen. I want to talk about something else that people have actually said this on some of our video, videos that we make pruno. Pruno is something completely different than wine, okay? I'm just gonna read a little bit about what pruno is and why it's so different. It's a little inaccurate to call pruno homemade, except perhaps as a science experiment. No sane person would make the stuff at home. Pruno producers aren't at home, they're in jail, where ingredients are scarce, wine making equipment even scarcer, and since drinking alcohol is strictly forbidden, the entire operation must be carried out in secret. The resulting beverage is foul tasting at best and life threatening threatening when things don't go as well. In 2011, eight inmates at a Utah prison contracted botulism, a rare and potentially deadly disease caused by Clostridium bot botulinum, botulinum bacteria from imbibing the nor notorious prison wine. And this wasn't the first time Pruno gulping. It's allegedly far too nasty to drink a sip. Okay, I don't need to get drunk that bad. Just saying. Prisoners have succumbed to botulism, nor was it the last. Just this past August, four Arizona inmates were diagnosed with the disease. Given that fewer than 100 cases of botulism crop up in the U.S. yearly, there are sizable outbreaks. Why is prison wine so prone to making people sick? Well, here's why. It's because they're using very questionable ingredients. Like, extraordinarily questionable. In the one from the guys in Utah, the, an inmate kept a baked potato in a sock under his mattress for three weeks before they started fermenting it. That's what gave them botulism. It's that simple. That's just, none of us would ever consider doing something like that. If, if they actually just took juice and added yeast to it, they'd be safe because we're talking a sterilized container, sterilized juice, everything is clean. The worst thing that you're putting in there is actually the yeast and the likelihood that that yeast has a bacteria or something on it is kind of slim to none. So, Pruno versus homemade wine from juice, not the same thing at all. While we're on the topic, I want to talk about turbo cider. All cider is made from juice. How you get that juice really is not that critical because what if you had apples and you juiced them yourself and you made a cider from that juice? It's cider, right? Well, if you just bought the juice and someone else did the juicing, does that make it any different than if you juiced them yourself? No. So calling it turbo cider is really just not a good thing just doesn't make any sense. It's not turbo cider. It doesn't ferment any faster. More recently, during the pandemic, a South African couple who decided to make homebrew beer got to get around the strict restrictions. They died. Um, they were 54 and 42. They died after drinking a bottle of homemade beer in Port Nall, South Africa. Now, I've not actually seen a proper response to the investigation on this one. However, it is believed that improper sanitation methods are at fault here. Um, what they mean by that is there was some bacteria found in those bottles. Now, the fact that it happened so fast, that's in question. Enjoying this video? Give us a like. And to see more, hit subscribe. I don't want to say anything bad about different countries in the way that governments are working. However, if your country's in lockdown for alcohol and they don't want you to buy it, they're probably going to use somewhat of a tactic to make you think that it's a bad thing to do it yourself at home too. Okay, I'm not saying that that's exactly what they're doing, but there does seem to be a little bit of fear mongering among this kind of thing. People even in the US say that this is bad. Homebrewing is bad, it's dangerous. And most of those people have interest in a major beer distributor or a winemaker or things like that. There's nothing wrong with making wine, beer, cider, and meat at home. It is completely safe as long as you do it properly. Properly basically means don't put stuff in there, 
okay? Don't put things like rubbing alcohol to up the ABV. People want to fortify things. It, it can be okay to do that. You just have to remember that you're now adding more alcohol to something. So you're taking in more alcohol. Well, in that alcohol could be some of these other things too, so you could be concentrating. Just remember that. I do want to talk about one thing though, the methyl production in homebrew. First, beer actually doesn't really produce any methyls. Almost a negligible, like completely negligible, if any at all. And it also produces such a low ABV that it's not really a problem. But what about methyl production in, so, you know, ciders and wines and meats? Because fruits actually produce the methyl. That's where a lot of that comes from. Honey does too. So how do you prevent methyls in homebrew? Simple. You don't. I'm actually going to read a section from the book I'm writing <laughs> where I did the research on this and found out some facts. And I just wanted to kind of read this over for you guys so you get an idea of first what my book is going to be about. A little plug there. And um, this is factual information about methyls. In most homebrews, the methyl content is so low you would have to drink gallons of it before you would even begin to be a problem. However, if you're drinking gallons of homebrew in a sitting, you have a larger problem and I suggest you seek professional help. I'm not even kidding. On average, wine contains about 0.012% methanol by volume. That's about 0.003 liquid ounces or 0.9 milliliters of methanol in a typical 750 ml bottle of wine. It's a very, I mean, it's, it's like a drop. <laughs> um, as little as 10 milliliters of methanol is very, very dangerous though. Okay, this is where we start to do some math causing blindness and 15 mil can cause death. Now, I've heard anywhere from that number up to 20 and 30. So I went with the lowest, the lowest number that was considered dangerous rather than casting a wider net. We were erring on the side of caution. Exactly. By my estimation, you would have to drink a little over 11 bottles of wine in a relatively short time period, say a few hours to get 10 milliliter. And that obviously means about 16 bottles of wine could be fatal. I would venture to say you'd have signs of an issue long before you'd have methanol poisoning. I do not suggest testing this theory. Essentially, you'd have to drink about 2.2 US gallons of wine to reach the 10 mil mark. That is a lot of wine in a short time period. Pretty sure your stomach wouldn't be able to handle it, as well as you'd have regular ethyl alcohol poisoning. I mean, you got to remember, you know, like I said before, ethanol is poison. It's just takes a lot more ethanol to cause really, really bad things to happen to you than it does for methyl. But you'd have to drink 11 bottles of wine to reach the bare minimum that would be considered dangerous for blindness. And the reason why we put the caveat of time restrictions on this is because your body metabolizes these yeah. things and you have to cram all that in in a short period of time like, so that you to drink that within like an hour metabolize it so that way you can poison yourself yeah why would you do that i don't know now people are like why does people keep saying that it's going to cause you to be blind well two things absorb the methyl alcohol that is your liver and your optical nerve so yes it can it cause true. blindness yeah but as you can tell by brian's numbers you need a lot of it. You need a lot. You need a lot. People are always asking about the t-shirts that we wear and where you can get them. Well, go here. So, basically, the answer to the question of, is homebrew safe? Yes, of course it is. As long as you do it properly, just like most things in life. You can make anything dangerous and you can make anything safe. It all depends on how you approach it. But for the most part, fermentation is a natural process. So as long as you don't mess with that and put in things that are dangerous to begin with, it's probably not going to be a bad product in the end. How do you know if your homebrew has gone bad and can kill you? Well, for one, if you see green, black, or blue hairy things growing in there, and it smells rancid and you gag before you can even get it to your mouth, don't drink it that's probably a sign that it's been infected with something. Most people who have problems from homebrew are in desperate situations. If you think about all that we talked about, the Pruno, the South Africa thing, all these people, as well as there's a lot of countries where alcohol is prohibited, period, so they're doing it all in secret. Almost every single case, 
is a situation like that. People who have access to clean water, sanit proper sanitization and proper brewing equipment in any way, shape or form, as well as clean ingredients, generally do not have these problems at all. Unless they did something really stupid, like, you know, pour a gallon of rubbing alcohol into your brew. So don't pour rubbing alcohol into your brew. So in summary, if you use quality ingredients, use um, safe brewing practices and have clean equipment, your homebrew is just going to be just as safe as any commercial wine, beer, or cider you can buy. So basically, just do everything that we do and you'll be fine. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye. One more thing.